Today we're going to look at what I think is one of the simpler approaches to creating power series. Well, for certain nice functions. And this could be done, you know, earlier in a calculus class than Taylor series are presented. Okay, so let's see how we're going to approach this. So we're going to start with the first well-known fact, and I think this should be no surprise, and that is that the cosine of t is always less than or equal to 1. Well, like I said, I think that's pretty clear. But then we're going to take this and use it to produce some more like interesting inequalities. So now let's note if we've got x bigger than or equal to 0, well, we can integrate this from 0 to x and we'll get an inequality. So let's do that. So we've got the integral from 0 to x of cosine of t dt is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to x of, well, just dt, so 1 dt. So note the antiderivative of cosine is sine, evaluated at x is sine x, evaluated at 0 is 0. So that gives us this nice inequality sine of x is less than or equal to x. And now I think you can probably guess where we're going here. We're just going to repeat this process. So, well, let's, like I said, repeat this process. So now we'll take the integral from 0 to x of the sine of t dt, and that'll be less than or equal to the integral from 0 to x of t dt, where I changed out my dummy variable just to make everything work here. But now the antiderivative of sine is negative cosine, so that gives us negative cosine evaluated between 0 and x. That should be cosine of t. And that's going to be less than or equal to, well, that's just simply going to be x squared over 2. But now cosine of 0 is 1, and cosine of x, well, that's cosine of x. So that gives us the following inequality. We have 1 minus the cosine of x is less than or equal to x squared over 2. But then we can flip this inequality and we'll see that this means that the cosine of x is bigger than or equal to 1 minus x squared over 2. Oh, but let's recall that we started with this inequality over here. So that allows us to maybe smush cosine between like two nice objects. So here we have 1 minus 1 half x squared is less than or equal to the cosine of x, which in turn is less than or equal to 1. And this occurs for all positive values of x. But now let's maybe do one more round of this to really iron in where we're going here. And then we'll present this as like a general statement that we can prove by induction. Okay, so let's maybe change the dummy variable here from x to t, and then we'll integrate from 0 to x like we've been doing. So that's going to maintain the inequality here. So we've got the integral from 0 to x of 1 minus 1 half t squared dt is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to x of the cosine of t dt, which in turn is less than or equal to the integral from 0 to x of simply dt. But now, making this calculation isn't too bad. This first bit will give us x minus. Well, we'll have 1 over 6 times x cubed, but I'm going to write that 6 as 3 factorial. So we have x minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed. And then here in the middle, we'll have the sine of x, you know, for the same reason as we got over here with this integration. And then over here on the right-hand side, we'll have x. Okay, great. So now let's maybe step back and see what we have. So for sine, we have this ascending alternating sum of odd powers of x with some coefficients. And let's notice that it ends with an exponent that's too larger than we have over here, and also it ends on a minus sign. So that's important to notice. 
Whereas for cosine, well, it also ends on a minus sign. And it looks like it ends on an exponent that's two less. But in fact, we can easily show by doing a couple more steps of this that we can pin this above by one half x squared plus one over four factorial x to the fourth. So it really could also end on an exponent that is two more. Okay, so let's start the next board with maybe some general versions of this inequality and this inequality, which will explore towards a proof of them. Maybe we won't do it super carefully, but we'll do the inductive step. So here's a more general version of those inequalities that we hinted towards on the last board. Well, we built up the first couple of them. So we've got sine of x is pinned between the following two polynomials. And this, I should say, is for non-negative values of x. So notice here we've got x minus x cubed over 3 factorial. You might guess that the next term is plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial. And then here in this side, we're ending with minus x to the 4n plus 3 over 4n plus 3 factorial. So that's the lower bound for sine. And then the upper bound for sine, well, it ends one less. So instead of subtracting off this x to the 4n plus 3 over 4n plus 3 factorial, we cut it off right before that and end with a plus x to the 4n plus 1 over 4n plus 1 factorial. Okay, good. And then we've got a similar inequality for cosine. So here we've got cosine is pinned below by 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial all the way up to minus x to the 4n plus 2 over 4n plus 2 factorial, and above, well, by this thing exactly with an extra term, and that extra term is a plus x to the 4n plus 4 over 4n plus 4 factorial. Okay, so this is really just begging us to introduce some notation to make this a little bit easier. So let's do that. So let's set s sub m of x equal to, well, a polynomial of the form that's bounding these sine functions. So I'll let this be equal to the sum as k goes from 0 to m, and then we'll have minus 1 to the k over 2k plus 1 factorial. So that's what we've got going on here. It's alternating. The denominators are odd factorials. And then here we'll have x to the 2k plus 1. And then we'll make a similar polynomial for cosine. So here we'll say c sub m of x is equal to, well, the sum as k goes from 0 to infinity, we have minus 1 to the k over 2k factorial, and then x to the 2k, kind of for the same reason right here. OK, so notice using this setup, our claim is equivalent to the following set of inequalities. We have s sub 2n plus 1 of x is less than or equal to sine of x, which in turn is less than or equal to s sub 2n of x. Let's just make sure that makes sense. So notice here the top term is 2m plus 1. So if we plug m equals 2n plus 1 here, well, we'll get, yeah, we'll get 4n plus 3 based off of the top term there. And then likewise, everything works out for this top part as well. Okay, and then what about the cosine inequality? Well, it's going to look pretty similar. Um, the top bound will be slightly different. We'll have c sub 2n plus 1 of x is less than or equal to the cosine of x, which in turn is less than or equal to c sub 2n plus 2 of x. Okay, so now how might we show this? Well, like I said, we could do it by induction, but we'll just do maybe the inductive step. Notice that the base case has been done with that exploration that we did before. So let's maybe assume that this one is true. So this first one involving the signs and we'll show that that will imply the cosine one is true. 
And likewise, you could assume that the cosine inequality is true and prove that the sine inequality is, is true, making this ladder between sines and cosines. Okay, good. So that means if we assume this is true, we can integrate it from zero to x of s sub two n plus one of t dt. And then likewise, we're in, gonna integrate zero to x of sine of t dt. And then above, we'll integrate zero to x of s sub two n of t dt. Okay, nice. So now let's see what those look like. So this one over here, well, note integrating will increase the exponent by one. So it'll be 2k plus two. And then we have to divide by the new exponent. That'll make it a 2k plus two factorial. And then evaluate from zero to x. So that gives us something like this. We'll have the sum as k goes from zero to two n plus one of minus one to the k over two k plus two factorial, and then times x to the two k plus two. So just to be super clear where that came from, that came from integrating this term right here. Okay, nice. And then integrating the sine term and doing the evaluation will give us one minus the cosine of x. Okay, and then what about this last term right here? Well, that's gonna give us essentially the same thing that we have here, except the upper bound will be two n. So here we'll have the sum as k goes from zero up to two n of minus one to the k over k plus two factorial, and then here we have x to the two k plus two. Okay, nice. Okay, so next up, what I'd like to note is that there's kind of a little bit of a problem with the indexing here in terms of our original sums. So notice that this k right here should really be a k plus one if it matches with our exponent and our denominator factorial. So perhaps that gives us some motivation to multiply this by a minus one and then bring a plus one in here. Okay, good. And then furthermore, notice that the starting term here is the x squared term, which means we're missing the constant term one. And that gives us some motivation to add that constant term one in and then subtract it out. And then after doing that in re-indexing, we'll see here that we have one minus c sub two n plus two of x on the lower end. So again, that's from re-indexing and then adding and subtracting one. And then here we have this one minus cosine of x and then doing the same thing over here. So making this a k plus one, doing a minus sign here, and then re-indexing this thing will give us a one minus c sub two n plus one of x. Okay, good. But now let's observe that we can just subtract a one from all parts of this inequality and then multiply by a minus one, thus flipping the inequality. But if we flip the inequality, we get c sub two n plus one of x is less than or equal to the cosine of x, which in turn is less than or equal to c sub two n plus two of x. But that means if we assumed the sine inequality, we got the cosine inequality. And then you can also show that if you assume the cosine inequality, then you can produce the sine inequality. But like I said before, that builds a ladder starting at the base case, producing all of these inequalities. Okay. So now let's maybe use this setup to get a nice formula for the remainder term. So getting remainders for Taylor polynomials is often a bit technical, but with this approach, it's really straightforward. And so our strategy will be to take these inequalities and subtract the left-hand bits. And I've noted over here that this S sub two n plus one is this polynomial written out and this S sub two n is this polynomial written out. So let's focus on the sine term first. 
So subtracting s sub two and plus one from all sides, we'll get zero is less than or equal to the sine of x minus s sub two n plus one of x, which in turn is less than or equal to, well, that difference s two n and s two n plus one. But notice every term in s two n is an s two n plus one, but s two n plus one has this single extra term. So that means when we do the difference, we get x to the 4n plus 3 over 4n plus 3 factorial. So that would be our remainder term. And now let's just notice that if we were to take n to infinity, this goes to zero because a factorial type term will always dominate an exponential type term, which is the kind of thing that we have going on here. But if that goes to zero, then that means sine of x um, is equal to the limit of these polynomials, but that's exactly producing the Taylor series or the power series for the sine function. And now let's notice exactly the same thing is happening with cosine. We'll have zero is less than or equal to the cosine of x minus c sub two n plus one of x which in turn is less than or equal to x to the 4n plus 4 over 4n plus 4 factorial, just looking at what remains over there. But now we'll see that this approaches zero as n approaches infinity as well. Okay, so there we have it. We've got this nice approach, not only to the power series, but to the remainder terms. So I'm actually gonna leave you with a little bit of an exercise to work out a similar result on your own. Okay, so using similar methods, we can derive the following result. And I'll leave this like as a homework. So let's fix the number a bigger than zero and observe that if t is on the closed interval from zero to a, we have the following fairly obvious inequality. One is less than or equal to e to the t, which is less than or equal to e to the a. So since a is fixed, e to the a is a constant. Then use multiple integration steps like we did to get a polynomial below e to the x and e to the x is bound above by some other polynomial, you know, just like we did over here. And then use that to show that if you take e to the x minus the lower polynomial, it's bound by the following remainder. So we've got x to the n over n factorial times e to the a minus one. And that's a good place to stay. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button, subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpinmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.